Okay, well, thank you again for joining the participation reports webinar. My name is Anna Tolwinska and I'm a member experience manager here at Crossref. I work as part of the member and community outreach team. And it's my pleasure to talk to you a bit about participation reports. So today I will show you how you can easily track what metadata you're registering with Crossref, why you should be checking the report regularly, how to interpret the reports, and how to improve your metadata coverage levels. Um, I'm trying to run these webinars monthly, so if you or your colleagues would like to join another one, please check our webinar page. Um, my colleagues Isaac Farley and Shane Smolian from our support team are also on this webinar and will help me with any questions while I'm presenting. And thank you both for joining. Thanks, Anna. Um, great. <laughs> Um, but before we jump in, I'm going to share a quick poll. Hopefully, um, when I launch it, you should see um, a box uh, pop up. So here we go. Um, okay. So um, the question here is, um, all the metadata I collect is automatically sent to Crossref. If you could answer that question for me, that would be fantastic. And I'll give everyone a minute to uh, submit their answers. Okay, it looks like most of you have submitted an answer, so I'm going to share the results with you now. And it looks like not sure has won. <laughs> so um, I'll talk a little bit more about this um, later on in the webinar. So please keep this in mind um, and we'll uh, come back to this again. So I'll go ahead and get started now by telling you a bit more about the reports. So what are the reports? They are a place where you can check what metadata you're registering with Crossref. They are open and free to use by anyone. They allow you to track the levels of metadata over time. So this is handy, um, especially if you are using service providers or a vendor and if you're or you know you're not part of the production team and you're not directly responsible for registering the metadata yourself they also allow members to see how they measure up to other members and see where the gaps are so that they can be improved there are now about close to two years old we launched them in the summer of 2018 um, they're still in beta or what we like to call phase one um, we're always hoping to improve them. So if you have any feedback, please, please let us know. And now um, why uh, you may be wondering why we developed these reports. Um, so they came about mainly because we have been hearing from our members that they're not always sure what metadata they're registering with us. We always assume that our members knew exactly what they were sending us. So we decided to make it easier for everyone, including ourselves, to see what met metadata was actually being registered. Um, this data has been available for quite some time via our REST API, but not everyone knew how to query our APIs or um, you know, they weren't very user friendly and more geared towards machines than actual, actual humans. Um, so there wasn't a very easy to use interface. Another reason for the reports was that it made it easier for our members to see what's missing and how to fill in the gaps and update their metadata. And lastly, the reports allow our members to track their progress and see if what they have updated is actually being reflected in Crossref. This brings us back to the poll at the beginning of the webinar. Not everyone was sure whether you know, all of the metadata they had was being sent to Crossref. Um, so you may think that you're sending something or a lot of metadata, but it might just be the 
required uh, elements and not additional optional rich metadata that makes your content more discoverable. So where does the metadata that you send to Crossref actually end up? So because Crossref's metadata is standardized and machine readable, it is very useful to many different organizations that we like to call metadata users that make your content more discoverable, richer, and more useful to your readers and um, such as researchers. And this slide shows exactly the ways that metadata gets used and different types of organizations that use um, the metadata. So when you're registering your metadata in Crossref, it's also very important to keep in mind that the metadata is correct so that there are no typos, errors, et cetera that it is complete, um, that all the fields um, that you can manage are added in, not just the first author, but all of them, uh, publication dates, and anything that's not required as well. You can ask your author for ORCID identifiers and funding data as well, um, and also make sure that it's up to date. It's really important to talk to your vendors too um, or service providers, as they may not always be aware of what you'd like them to register on your behalf. So they may still be using an outdated schema, or they may not know that um, you want to send in something um, that Crossref, you know, is now collecting. There may also be extra costs involved, so just keep um, the lines of communication open with your vendors and your service providers if you have them. And once you update the metadata, you can expect it to see reflected in the participation report in about 24 hours. And all updates are free of charge. So you don't have to ever pay for any updates to your um, metadata that you've registered with us already. Okay. So now um, let's see how participation reports actually work. So when you navigate to the main page of the reports, uh, you will see a search box and you can enter in, start typing in the name of the uh, organization and it should pop up in the drop down below. So today I'm going to be looking at the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. They have a um, nice uh, looking report, a very good coverage on, in most areas. So I wanted to use them as an example. And, um, so in the search box, um, if you um, navigate to a name that, um, and you made a mistake, you can always go back to find a member and start over. So that's just how you go back. Um, but when you're looking at the report, you should see your organization's name listed here, and then a total registered uh, uh, number of content items. So this is the total number of DOIs that you registered with us for um, you know, a specific content type. In this case, it's journal articles. Um, that content type is the uh, total registered content items is, are dependent on the date range that you select. So right now we're looking at current content. So for the current period of time, which is defined as the year that we're uh, currently in, so the year 2020, and two prior years, so 2019 and 2018, um, that is what we consider current content. So in the last two and some years, uh, PNAS uh, registered, uh, you know, close to 10,000 DOIs. So that's what we're looking at here. Um, when uh, you look at the lower end of um, the report, the content type, it usually defaults to the main content type. So in this case, it's journal articles, because that is what um, this particular uh, member is registering, but if you were looking at different content types, the main content type would be uh, the one that has the most DOIs registered, and I will show you an example of that later. So you can change the content type here if there was one, um, and below you see 10 different um, metadata elements that we think are really important in making your content more useful and discoverable to the scholarly community. 
and I will go um, over each one of them. So if you're ever if you ever land on this report and you're confused as what you're looking at, um, you can hover over the eye, and it tells you exactly what the element is and what the percentage means. Um, so the percentages are usually a reflection of the total DOIs that you see here. So um, in this case, um, PNAS is uh, registering um, uh, 9,000 journal articles and 94% of those DOIs have references deposited as part of the metadata deposit. And um, references are really important because they provide a vital po data point through which to find your content. And they also enable you to use Cited By, which is a service that we provide to our members free of charge. And this service allows you to query the publications that cite your work and also allows you to show um, cited, the citation counts. So if you wanna participate in Cited By, um, you need to register your references. So that's really uh, important. Next up, we have open references. And this is just a reflection of whether your references are open across all of our APIs and services. So if you're registering references, the ones that we talked about here, um, are you making them available across all of our services? So in this case, um, PNAS is because the percentage is 100%. If you're seeing a zero um, next to open references, that means that you're not sharing them across all of our APIs. Um, if you want to change that, you can always email us and, and we can make that change for you really quickly. And then you can see that reflected on your participation report. Next up, we have ORCID identifiers. So ORCID IDs allow you to precisely identify a researcher's work even if that researcher shares a name with another. Um, and in this case, 67% of the 9,000 articles have at least one ORCID identifier registered. So it's really important, um, especially you should ask your authors, if you're not currently collecting ORCID identifiers, um, you should ask your authors to get them. And also if um, you are collecting them, please send them um, to us. Okay, uh, next up we have funder registry IDs and funding award numbers. They kind of go together um, to create funding data in Crossref and it's, it's really important to include names and funder IDs of organizations that funded the research because that allows publishers to analyze sources of funding and to ensure you know, compliance with funder mandates for authors, allows funding organizations to better tr track published results of their grants um, and allows for greater transparency. So if you are collecting fun funding information, um, you can always match the funder name to a funder registry ID. We have over 21,000 funder names now on uh, the registry. And if you don't find the funder name, you can always ask us to add it in um, and you can submit that through your metadata. So in this case, about 69% of the 9,000 journal article, over 9,000 journal articles have some sort of funding um, information registered. Next up, we have Crossmark um, enabled. And that means um, that uh, PNAS is participating in the Crossmark service, which uh, helps uh, readers to see whether the content has been updated since publication. So if, um, if uh, you like to participate in this service, you can include Crossmark metadata in the metadata and also display a widget on your HTML and your PDFs. It's a, it's a pop-up that allows the reader to see whether the content has changed since publication. And in this case, um, over our, you know, all of the journal articles have Crossmark metadata registered. Okay, next up we have text mining URLs. And this is just an example that, you know, not everyone will have high percentages everywhere. Um, so in this case, PNAS is not registering text mining URLs um, at this time, but um, text mining URLs are 
uh, help researchers automatically analyze and extract information from a large number of documents at the same time. Um, so it makes it easier for re researchers to mine your content. So you can include full text um, for the purposes of text mining in Crossref's metadata if you are interested. Um, you can also indicate through the license what the researcher can or cannot do with your full text. Um, in terms of you know, text and data mining, you can also include license URLs to show, um, um, uh, to add open licenses such as Creative Commons or your own proprietary licenses, uh, which tell you know, users what they can or cannot do with um, the content. And uh, since we're on the URLs, uh, there is another URL that you can include, which is a full text URL. Um, and that is if you're participating in our similarity check service, which allows you to check your content for um, potential plagiarism, you are required to include full text URLs so that authenticate um, uh, the, uh, our technology a partner for similarity check um, can index your full text and add it to the great big database that then allows you to check your content against. Um, so that is a plus um, of participating in similarity check. And last but not least, abstracts. So um, abstracts are really important because they give more information to the user about your content. Um, thus making your content more discoverable. So if you do have abstracts and you can submit them to Crossref, we would encourage you to do so. In this case, 82% of the 9, 000, over 9,000 articles are including abstracts. Okay, so that is kind of like a really quick tour of participation reports. Um, but I said, I mentioned that I would show you examples of publishers with additional um, content um, and what that looks like when you do it uh, when you select the drop down. So in this case, I think we have to go to the back files. In this case, uh, Hindawi uh, has three different content types and they're listed here. So you can look, um, of course, it defaults, as I mentioned, to the one with the greatest amount of DOIs or content items, which is the journal articles. Um, but if you want to select and look at different content types, then you can um, go to the drop down menu and select, for example, conference papers. Um, and you will see that for other content types, journal articles are the ones that have the most metadata um, associated with them. Um, different content types have much you know, fewer metadata coverage, although we still allow for it and encourage it as well. Um, so if you have, you know, if you're only registering conference papers, um, you should still uh, submit references and uh, ORCIDs and all that good stuff. It's uh, quite important. And if you look at books, there's a more a, of a limited number of um, key elements that we uh, list out, but it's still you know important to submit as much as you can. And I think I have another example of just a rich rich metadata um, in terms of the dropdown. So Springer, for example, has book chapters, books, data sets, and journal articles. So this is just another really good example of um, you know, additional content types. Um, um, and then I think I may have, um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but you can also look up individual journals. So if you are an organization that has multiple journals, um, you can look them up individually. So for example, um, I'm going to select this, you know, this particular title, which actually doesn't have very good coverage. Um, let's see if there's another. Um, yeah, and this one actually does. So it depends on the title as well. Um, but if you have journal editors that might be interested in, you know, keeping track of their title and the metadata coverage, it's a good way um, of doing that. Okay. So that is the participation report in a nutshell. Let's see what we have here. Just have... Um, Let 
just have an activity now. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, let me stop the recording. Let's see.